Welcome to Old Path and our study through the Old Testament. We are currently in the book of Esther and we make it to chapters 4 and 5 today. Before we get to the text, um, some things that, that are kind of interesting if you've read ahead of this or if you've read it recently. Um, the way that things happen and they are so perfectly situated, people that, that may not take the view of the scripture that it is something that not only covers the real genuine events, but does so in such a way as to not only record the events, but in this case, the intervening hand of God is really obvious in this whole thing uh, from the perspective of people who believe that God does govern in, in such ways. And the timing, like I say, and even the, the, the ways that, that things happen sequentially and the, the kind of point and counterpoint of the whole discussion and the whole way that this is presented, I can see how people who might not believe that the Bible is genuinely the Word of God speaking about actual events as they happen without any embellishment would look at a book like this and just think, yeah, man, this sounds like a movie script because how is it that everything happened just at the right time in just the right way? How is it that everything that the evil guy wanted to do and all of the plans that he had made completely got turned on its head and it really turned out to be against him. How is it that that's possible that every single conceivable way, every, if you will, plot twist in the story works out like it's something out of a movie? And so how is it that this could happen and how could they have known that this reaction would, or that this action would cause this reaction and as I'm saying all of this, if you're not really following, you're going to see what I mean in these uh, in, in these two chapters as we go through them. And so I wanted to deal with this before we even start looking at the text. Here's what we need to remember, that there are a few things that are, that are obvious that we should just be able to take away from this. And even if you're one of those people who look at, at the Bible and think, well, it has very important things in it, but it's not like we need to take every chapter of every book with a real genuine seriousness, there may very well be storytelling, there may be embellishing, there may be, you know, kind of some hyperbolic things that are that are said or done, depending on what book you're looking at. And I'll say this, there are places where you find very poetic language. I think of the book of Psalms. Um, even in some place, there's some humor and almost even sarcasm. And, and uh, I could say you could you could even look at it as somewhat cynical, like you'll find in the book of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes and places like that when Solomon was writing. So there's no question that there is the day-to-day -day humanity kind of stuff that you'll find in the text. Esther is set up differently because let's remember what's going on here in the historic sense. Historically speaking, what you have is the time that... Let's go back to Jeremiah's time. As you read through the prophet Jeremiah and the other contemporary prophets that would be speaking to Judah, by this time um, of Jeremiah's time, uh, towards the latter part of, of his ministry, really all that's left is the two southern tribes that would comprise Judah and then whatever element that you would have of, of people from the other tribes who had moved into that territory because of marriage or whatever reason, the other tribes have been pretty much absorbed into Assyria, and so everything up in the north, and if you want to look at a map, you can, but think of Jerusalem, and uh, as you're looking a little bit to the north, Benjamin's territory, very small portion of it, kind of goes this direction. It's not some big tall, it's more thin. You would have Judah here, and then Benjamin here. Everything up above it is part of the northern kingdom, what we would call Israel. And so Israel and Judah were split right after the time of, of uh, Solomon, the king, and his son Rehoboam had the, the lower portion, uh, and then Jeroboam uh, took the upper portion. And a hundred years before um, Judah was, was taken away into its captivity, um, Assyria pretty much conquered the entirety of the north and absorbed it into their group. So by the time that Jeremiah is giving very stern warnings to Judah. Israel's pretty much gone. It's not that the, the place is desolate. There are people who inhabit that, but it's it's become very much incorporated by all of the pagan culture of, uh, of Assyria and the people that would have moved in there. It's no longer purely the tribes of the north anymore. So it's just, it's a, a non-player at this point. So Jeremiah, the other contemporary prophets, are saying to Judah, 
Judah, the things that you are doing is exactly what Israel was doing. And it allowed God then allowed them because of their wickedness and their evil to be taken not only captive, but to be conquered by Assyria. Don't let the same things happen to you. Well, clearly they're not listening to him and the other prophets. Jeremiah ends up telling them, you're going to go away into a captivity and it's going to last for 70 years. He's told that. He's told that to them. And at the end of that 70 years, God will restore you back to the land. He's told them all of that. What ends up happening during that time, and we get this from Daniel, we know that there is a, a change in the government and we watch it take place. God says through, uh, through Isaiah that it's going to be a king named Cyrus that is going to, to kind of bankroll and lead the, the beginning of the restoration back in the land. But from Jeremiah's perspective, Guys, we've really got a problem here, and our eyes have been taking off, taken off of the Lord. If we don't take very quick action, he's going to judge, and he's going to do so at the hands of the Babylonians. He tells them all of that. God's already told them, they're not going to listen to you, and I'm going to do this thing because of what their spiritual condition is. In comes Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. They are taken away, and their captivity of 70 years begins. During that 70 years, the world power shifts from the Babylonians to the Medo-Persians. And that is where we are in, uh, in the time that we have here with Esther. <clears throat> she is during the reign of a man named Xerxes, and, uh, or Ahasuerus. He has both names. And after that is Artaxerxes, and that brings us to the time of, of uh, um, Ezra and Nehemiah that we've already studied. So with all of that as kind of the background, what we have here is the second half, if you will, of the captivity of the of the Jews before they start to be brought back. And it won't be long. Now, by this time, Zerubbabel has already started that group coming back because Ezra and Nehemiah are decades, almost 100 years later, uh, before they start their work of going back and continuing that work that started by Zerubbabel. So a lot of time lapses in this. A lot of time goes by. So with all of that being said, God knows he's bringing them back. Well, if God knows he's bringing them back and he has said as much, the devil knows that as well. So anything that he can do to try to slow down the work, he knows the promise all the way back that Messiah would come through the, the line of Abraham. And so throughout history, you can find that the desire of nations to destroy the nation of Israel or the people, the Jewish people, those of the heritage beginning at Abraham. And so we have from ancient history, this is one of those, those places, up into our modern history. There were the, there were the things that, that happened during the Holocaust. We have uh, a number of attempts that have made since Israel came back into the land, uh, some from, from 48 to 67 to 73. The, uh, the nations around them wanting to eradicate the nation of Israel once it's come back in. And in our modern day, there are nations that want nothing more than to see the entirety of the Jewish people removed from the planet. Now, of course, that'll never take place. We have everything in, in history, not only showing that God is always coming to the aid of his people, but more importantly, we know that the scripture tells us everything that will be happening future in big picture. We just see the little elements of it taking place around us. Well, what we have here in Esther is one of those attempts where uh, the, the evil of the people that are there and, and headed up by a man named Haman. We've already heard his name mentioned, but Haman wanted to destroy, and that edict has already gone out in, out, in throughout all the provinces, the entire territory governed by the, the Persian Empire, that the Jews were to be eradicated from the time that it was written down till it would take effect is almost a year's time. So that's where we get in, in chapters four and five. Now, with all that said, all of these these desires, all of these, you know, uh, uh, plans and the implementation of them are already in order. But here's the wonderful thing about it. When you read the things that we read, remember that God is not limited by time and things are not revealed to him day by day. He knows them before they happen. So the easiest way for us to put it in the most simple ways is time, as we would understand it, from the creation till when the, the Lord establishes the forever kingdom is just a strip of time. It's a timeline, but God's outside of it. So as far as Haman is concerned and all of his plans, God already knows them. And every little bit of it, God already knows what his action is going to be 
even though the people who are doing the things that they're doing are in real time. They're just making decision after decision after decision. God sees it all. And he maneuvers things in place the way that he wants them to be. So it can look like a movie script. It's just too perfect. Everything is almost to the point of being so predictable that we know what God's going to do precisely. And the important part of it is that we could step away from it and say, either this is just some work of fiction and it's you know like a made-for-TV movie where everything is just so over the top and precise, or we would be able to say, no, 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 this is an evidence that God knows every little twist and turn in a particular episode, and he's going to maneuver everything into place so that it is a obvious that he knows what is taking place, and he moves everything into its position before it needs to be there. And even the things that don't make sense to us, when they do make sense, finally, they are so perfectly placed, every little detail is seen to in perfection. It's almost as though it is made up. Well, in God's mind, every little bit of it is already concluded because he knows the outcome of all of it. So maneuvering everything that he's going to do, even the way that you're going to see how Haman reacts towards Mordecai and the counsel that he gets is so ridiculous. And every plan that he makes not only falls apart, but every consequence that there should have been for Mordecai ends up happening to Haman. And that's what makes it almost seem like, oh, come on, you expect me to believe that? Well, if I didn't believe in the authenticity of the scripture or the person that, that's the, the writer of it, God himself, yeah, I could see how you could make the case. However, if I'm going to take the view as I do that God knows every single event before it takes place, he's going to make it so that it is without question that he is involved in the process. And that's the intention behind all of this. And I, I'm convinced of that. So it's with that tact that I want to look at the text. From the, the point of view, God knows everything in its entirety, step by step, and he places everything where it needs to be that every every concocted thing in the mind of man, every idea that comes to his mind that is evil in its intent, God is going to turn it back on them. And we get little places in the passages of Scripture that kind of say that. That where we read in Romans, where it says in chapter 8, that all things work together for the good to those that are loved of God and called according to his purposes. I believe that's 828. Uh, the story of Joseph and the things that God had, or that man had intended for his evil. This, In this case, his brothers, God has turned to his good as, as Joseph reveals himself to his brothers who they thought they had sold off and who knows what had happened to him. Now he becomes only second to Pharaoh in all of Egypt. And so he's able to say, what you guys intended for evil, God intended for my good. That's precisely what we see here in Esther in probably a, about as detailed of an account as we have anywhere in the text where you can see the immediate minute detail intervention that God made in the life of his people. They needed to be preserved because God had future plans and that those future plans was going to include the savior of mankind in the eternal sense. So clearly God's going to put everything in place and at the same time leave his calling card in this. That there's no question that he has been involved with it. And though you've already heard me say his name is not mentioned, you will see that there is very, very clear indication that the people involved in this were very much dependent upon him for provision. So it's with all of that that we look at the text. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll take a look. Father, we thank you so much for coming to your word and knowing that your Holy Spirit can lead us and guide us in our understanding. So we pray that you would open our eyes and help us to see your hands in our text as we read through it today. And we give to you all thanks and praise in Jesus' name. All right. So chapter 4 says this. Now, when Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went into the midst of the city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry, and he went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's uh, gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, uh, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. So <clears throat> this is, as chapter 3 ends, the, the decree goes out. And what's going to be taking place? 
the, the king has signed off on it at the behest of, of uh, Haman because the, the whole charge was, you have people, the Jews, living among us and in all of your provinces who don't, uh, don't do according to our laws like everyone else. Now remember, Haman himself is a man who shouldn't exist. He belongs to a group of people that Israel was told to eradicate. They were already judged when God brought his people into the land and God said, I've already judged them. Now I'm going to use you as my instrument of justice. And they did not do as they had said. So this man should never have been, and now he's in a foreign nation and he has got the king of Persia agreed to eradicate all of the Jews. That gets written down when it's going to take place. It goes everywhere. <clears throat> and now the information is out there. With that as the backdrop, Mordecai reads this, and he's going to go into a place of very national and very, well, personal, but for the, the sake of his nation, of his people, it's a very outward mourning. And it's not just a Jewish thing, it's very much a Middle Eastern thing. Even to this day, the idea of expressing outwardly grief, it is very expressive, easy to see. It's intended to be very, very noticeable. The idea of tearing your clothes is that 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 visible sign of distress, sackcloth and ashes, is a place of just destruction and mourning and, and that, that sense of brokenness, and it's there for everyone to see. So what we read in this is that Mordecai, as soon as he sees all of the things that are written down, and this is what's going to take place, he goes into a very public way of showing grief and anguish and fear and mourning and terror, and it's there for everyone to see, and it begins to make people start to talk. Now, because it's very much an accepted kind of a cultural norm for that part of the world, it's happening among the Jews everywhere in the nation. So, as far as Mordecai is concerned, where he normally has somewhat of a being in the court place where the king could potentially hear or see it, <clears throat> he doesn't go there. It's not even allowed to be taking place. The king is never to lay eyes upon the idea of people openly mourning and grieving and all the rest. It's just a bad optic. That shouldn't be going on in the country. The country shouldn't be in a place of mourning. It makes It's a reflection on the king. The king doesn't want to see it. All that seems to be kind of simmering or bubbling up in the background. So Mordecai goes to the place where he can do that without fear of reprisal. So he goes into the very public area and he begins to express and to show all of that. And as we see in verse 3, it's beginning to happen all throughout the nation. So in verse 4, so... Esther's maids and eunuchs came and they told her. She didn't see it with her own eyes, nor did the king. Um, but she, in this case, is told Mordecai is doing this. And seemingly the rest of, of the information gets to her, as we'll see. So um, the queen was deeply depressed, it tells us, distressed rather. And then she uh, sent garments and to clothe Mordecai and to take his sackcloth away from him but he would not accept it. So what you find here is that she's not fully understanding the, the depth of the whole thing, and it may not be as, as serious. It's clearly not as serious as in her eyes because she just says, well, bring him some other clothes. Let's help him get past this public mourning, and let's get to the bottom of what it is, having no idea how serious it is. Verse 5, so then Esther called Hathak, um, one of the king's eunuchs, who had appointed to uh, to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what this was all about. Or, okay, it's much worse than I thought. It's not just some little simple thing that we can now clothe him. It's not a deep mourning kind of thing. This was going to be an ongoing problem. She wants to find out what the deal is. She's wanting to get the information. So he went out uh, to Mordecai in the city square in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told all that had happened to him, and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. And he also gave him a copy of the written decree for the destruction, which was given at Shushan, uh, that they might show it to Esther and explain it to her, and that he commanded her to go into the king to make supplication to him and to plead before him for her people. And so uh, Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. So it's pretty easy to track. It's a pretty, what you would expect, a very a, a very um, predictable uh, way of doing this. 
Esther has uh, Mordecai as a relative, hears that there's some really serious thing that has caused Mo Mordecai to grieve, go get me details. Mordecai says, here's the problem, and lays it all out, even sends a copy of the letter, which again, none of this was known to Esther. Now, when it ends up coming to her attention, verse 10, Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman that goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all of them to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go into the king uh, these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. Clearly, she knows the protocol. You want me to go in and talk to the king? I haven't even been summoned to him. And actually, if I go in there without being announced and without proper invitation by him, just my presence there could get me killed. So <clears throat> here's the dilemma. And again, is God going to work something out? We already know the answer. But, you know, sometimes it's good for us to try to, in some way, relate a little bit. Man, what would it be like to be these people? Because you realize that any misstep is it. That would be the last of it. <clears throat> so here, Esther just realizes, I'm sure I'm the, I'm the person that's put in the place of being the queen, but I haven't seen him in a month. So it just shows you the kind of way of life that that would be. You could be the queen, and yet you don't have direct access to your king, your husband in this case, because she's just one of many that would have access to him. And we know that between wives and concubines and all the rest, she had that place of being the official you know, person referred to as the queen, but they, they lived very much separate lives as we see right here. It's not the, you know, it's not <laughs> I love Lucy kind of a, they're the married couple that, you know, does everything together. It's, it is about as far from that as, as possible. So she says in a very real sense to Mordecai, hey, I get what you're asking me, but you do realize that me even doing what you're proposing that I do could get me killed. And this is that, that part of Esther that everybody seems to remember. And it gets quoted very often. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. So Mordecai told them to answer Esther. Do not think that you're in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than any of the other Jews. Now, one thing to point out here, because it's important, is this, is this something that he's saying to her as a warning, or is he saying it to her as a threat? You know, what, what's the intention behind this? Does he really believe that that's what Esther is thinking, or is she just saying, help me figure out where to go from here, Mordecai, because the real, the, in the real sense... My life is on the line here, as is the rest of us. But Mordecai wants her to remember, just because of your position, whether this is what you're thinking or not, and I'm hoping that's where Mordecai is in this whole thing. Well, let, let me just point this out to you, Esther. Yeah, your life may be on the line, but let's just make sure <clears throat> that if you don't say anything, don't think that somehow you would escape if that's even the thought. So better for you to do what is the right thing and make him aware of it because you're not going to escape either way. That more than likely is the case because it doesn't seem like it should be adversarial. And at the same time, as Mordecai would say it, it's a, it's a way of just saying her, look at the big picture here. Because if you go in and you're not wanted, yeah, it may cost you your life now, but it's certainly going to cost your life down the road if it turns out that all of us are eradicated. You're not going to escape. So, verse 14. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will, will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to this kingdom for such a time as this. That's the very big quotable thing that we hear from Esther all the time. So there's a really interesting thing in this because Mordecai, as far as he's concerned, there are some things that make him very clearly Jewish. We don't bow to other people. We may be in captivity, but the whole thing, the whole reason why this whole problem between Haman and Mordecai is Mordecai will not bow to Haman. Now, whether it's just his own stubbornness or the, uh, the understanding that there is some remnant of his understanding that we don't bow for anybody but God alone, theologians disagree on which one of those is the correct one. But we would have to believe that to some extent, though there's no speaking of God or anything else in this, we do see that there are some very, very recognizable things about them that they know where they come from. 
So, and I'll get to that in just a moment. So, what what uh, Haman's or what uh, Mordecai rather says here is just some very obvious. Let's just say them here. If you don't do something about it, then we're going to get deliverance from somewhere. So there has to be that recognition that in our history, we have been faced with things like this before, and yet God always gets us out of it. This is a, a place where that may very well be, and I expect that it is the mindset of Mordecai that God will find a way in this whole thing, but the idea that it won't be, it'll be provision for us, but it won't be provision for you is also that idea that God is just. And if you, for trying to preserve your own neck, desire not to partake in this whole thing, he'll judge you for it. That seems to be very much implied. But remember, but who knows whether or not you have come to this kingdom for such a time as this. And here's that place where the implication of God that, hey, you've been raised up to this place in the first place, and we're here because of our rejection of God. Don't do what's been done before. So by implication, the understanding that these were people who knew at least in in round figures, in big ways of understanding that God is involved in these in these types of situations and has been all along. If they know any of their history, they know that they are there because God had put them there. Now, and in the midst of that, Esther has now been elevated to this place of access that Mordecai doesn't have yet. <laughs> so verse 15, Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Well, then go gather all the Jews who are at present in Shushan and fast for me. So the idea of fasting, of course, is understood. And some would say, well, it was an Eastern thing. And yet you wouldn't fast unless you had something that you were hoping as entreaty from whoever it is that your deity was at the time. If it's among Jews, they don't understand gods other than the, the God of, of Israel. And the fasting would have to be in that sense of, I need you to to kind of set yourself to do this for this time. And part of fasting is praying. Those two things work hand in glove. There's no reason to fast if you're not going to have that, that, you know, keeping yourself from particular things to focus your, your attention on prayer or consideration, supplicating before God, all of those things. That's all part of fasting. So the idea that she would ask to have that done on her behalf that she would have favor when she goes to the king, it's pretty obvious to whom and for what reason the fasting would be being done. So as she says this, go and gather the Jews who are present at Shushan, fast for me, neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so her maids, are they Jewish or are they not Jewish, but they've come to know what she knows? So again, you don't have to have, quote, God's name mentioned in the text to see his, his, not only his working in this, but also that his people would petition him. It doesn't have to be said. Clearly, he was brought up in their conversations. Had to be. We just don't have record of it here in the little bits that we have. Because remember, it's three days that they're fasting and praying before any of this goes on. So do this for three days. Go and gather all the Jews and eat, eat or drink nothing for three days, night or day. And my, my maids and I will do the same. Also, I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and he did according to all that Esther had asked or required, commanded. So the table is set. I think any of us here, especially as we're, you know, as we look at the scriptures and, and recognize the importance of what we see in the text, we would look at this and we, we already know the outcome of it. Whether we've read the book or not, we know how this is going to end. But the, the interesting thing is how God takes those things that man devises and has them turned against him. They are their own trap. So this is what ends up happening after. Chapter 5, verse 1 says, Now it happened in the third, uh, on the third day that Esther put on her royal robes, stood in the inner court of the king's palace across from the king's house, and while the king sat on his royal throne in the royal house, facing the entrance of the house, again, a way of looking out and seeing everything that's there, so the people that are coming by and all the rest that would be coming to that place have the intention of, of seeing and being seen. That's her concern. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight, and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand, then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter, 
And the king said to her, What do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall be given to you up to half of the kingdom. Now, again, there's a lot of question. What does he mean by half of the kingdom? Is it just kind of a euphemism? Is it intended? I'll do what you're asking. You know, I, I would give as much as half of my kingdom to meet your request. It's not just saying, this is what you'll get. And it's it's not one of those kind of things that it's it's said with absolute you know, get out your calculator and find out how much is half of his kingdom worth. It's more one of those things, I'm going to give you above what you're even asking. Don't worry about it. What is it that you want? Don't be fearful kind of a thing. So biggest hurdle is now already overcome. Now she can come and, and lay out the whole thing. And you're going to notice as you read this, if you've never studied through the book of Esther before, you're going to notice something here. It's like, well, why don't you just go ahead and get right to it? And we might look at it and say it's hesitancy. It's any number of things, but I want to be more careful with it than that. It's like, you know, she, she knows what she's about to say is a big ask that Haman is very, very close to the king and just blurting it all out there. Hey, Haman wants to kill me and all of my people. What are you going to do about it? It would have been easier for her to throw that out, but it seems as though God is letting the whole thing play out because how it's going to end becomes a much better a much more detailed kind of a way, and, and you definitely see God's hand in it. So I would tend to, to be in that camp of believing that she knew a lot more about what God was going to do, and she was being much more heavily directed by him because they had, as a whole group of people who were in the inner circle of this, they had been fasting. They had been praying for three solid days. And if that fasting and praying is as I think it is towards God— God, Esther needs to have favor when she goes there. Give her the words to speak. Help her to know when and how and what and all the rest of that stuff. And so what seems like, from some people's point of view, procrastination because of maybe fear may very well be that, no, 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 she's just really cool in this because God is directing her and allowing a lot of additional things to happen that when it all comes to light, the picture is seen in even greater ways. And then what God ends up doing, people walk away from it saying, wow, there had been intervention in this. God's hand was really in this. Because if she goes in and blurts it out, she may be able to thwart it all. And Haman may be, you know, cast out or whatever else. But the fullness and the way that God is able to bring his people through what would be otherwise, it's an existential thing. This is like, this could be the end of them all. Um, God does what is nothing short of beyond imagination, um, miraculous things, but he uses very temporal, very imperfect people to do such extravagant and wonderful things. And that's what we have here. So with all that being said, we see in verse four, so Esther answered, if it is pleasing to the king, then let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for them. <clears throat> so there's already things being put in place, already in motion. She already has, if you will, a game plan here. I don't want to say the whole thing right here. What I'd like to ask is that I would like to do something in your honor, a banquet, something where we could come and partake of things. You and Haman, I would like to have you as my guests. And so as we think of banquet, again, there's there's not necessarily total consensus on this, but from what you see as far as as the, the cultures of the time, what we have from historic references, it was one thing when people would come that there would be the meats and all the things that you would have as, a, as like, you know, food. And then afterwards, as you kind of retire, that would be the place after food has been served, then there's a time where they're drinking wine and all the rest. It's a, it's a second part to the, if you will, banquet. So she asks for him and for Haman it's already as she the the way that she says this gives the impression it's already been prepared for you. I'm ready to to receive you to where I am, and that you and Haman would come as my guests, and I've prepared a banquet for you. Would you come? It's an invitation that she gives, so she doesn't even begin to address the problem. Now, it tells us <clears throat> so the king said, "Bring Haman quickly, and uh, that he may do as Esther has said." And so the king. And Haman went to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Now, 
what we have here is a description of the banquet of wine. So it gives an impression, and most people that, that uh, you would read on this or, or looking at it from the cultural and the historic is that the banquet would have its separate parts and there would be the actual partaking of a meal, but then there would be the much more social together kinds of things, the banquet of wine. Now this would be, and again, it's, it's a very calculated thing if that's the case and if that's the, really the layout of the evening, after they've had a chance to to you know have wine and and there's all the social things, Haman's just amazed that he's been asked to come to this, and there's all of that kind of stuff. And the more that they would drink, there is that kind of breaking down a little bit of inhibitions and all the rest. So it would be a if you're going to ask such a big thing or make such a big situation of all of this, the idea that people would be a little bit more you know pliable, I guess is a good way of putting it. You can see why this is really well thought out. Well, so um, at the beginning of the, or rather verse six, at the banquet of wine. And so if we believe that it is as history and, and uh, cultural things are, this is at, towards the latter part of the evening. And they've already been you know, able to drink during that banquet of wine. It's kind of as it's winding down a bit. Then the king said to Esther in verse six, what is your petition? It shall be granted to you. What is your request? Up to half of my kingdom it shall be done. Second time she's heard that. Then Esther answered and said, My petition, my request is this. If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fully, uh, and fully my request, fulfill rather my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king said. So let's make this day number two. Now, the idea that you would have multiple days of celebration and all the rest, and I'm sure that there are plenty of other festivities that are part of this. There's got to be the entertaining, and it's a big thing. Let's do this tomorrow. Let's continue our feasting. Let's you know get an, an, an evening's kind of sleep, and we'll pick it up tomorrow. It's just the festivities of the whole thing. If I found favor, she says, I don't need to get to it right now. Can we continue this on tomorrow? And then I will tell you all of this. So apparently in the way that this is all done, it doesn't raise any suspicion. So it must have had that very comfortable, festive kind of thing like, yeah, let's continue it on to the next day. Why, you know, why stop a good thing? Let's just continue it. We'll get a night's sleep and we'll pick it up tomorrow. Well, that night, and here's one of those things. This... This, if you will, had it all been brought up immediately, Haman would have already been exposed and the king would have realized that what he had agreed to was done for reasons that, that he was not privy to, not even realizing, of course, that Esther would be in the crosshairs of this whole thing. If all of that had taken place front end of this, then there's not going to be the rest of this story wouldn't have taken place because watch what happens in that intervening part of the time. So, if I have found favor in the sight of the king, is what she says in verse 8. And so that night, as, her, as it's winding up, verse 9, Haman went out, uh, of that on, out on that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, and that he did not stand or tremble before him, he was filled with indignation against Mordecai. He was furious. Everything was couldn't have been better, man. I was invited by the queen to come and hang out with the, with her and the king. And of all of that, after all of that wonderful, I'm just so happy. And here's Mordecai. And he can't get past it. This pridefulness, this anger. And really, again, why is it that Haman hates him so bad? I don't even think Haman understands why he hates him so bad. And again, the reason is, it's a spiritual matter. The idea that he won't pay him the due respect as he sees it, that everybody else does, makes Mordecai the focus. But there's a spiritual aspect to this because the devil's pulling the strings. That we know. So in verse uh, um, 10, nevertheless, Haman restrained himself, went home, and he sent and called for his friends and for his wife. So Haman told them, of his great riches. Here's all the stuff that I have, the multitude of my children, everything in which the king has promoted him and uh, and how he had advanced him above all of the officials of the king. So he says, look, I'm a man who has, he brings everybody in. I'm a guy who has everything. I've got riches. I got kids. I got privilege. I got a place next to the king. And he says, moreover, Haman said, besides Queen Esther invited me 
um, uh, no one rather but me to come in with the king uh, to the banquet that she had prepared. And tomorrow I am again invited by her along with the king. Yet all of this avails me nothing. Why? Or for what? So long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting in the king's gate. None of that stuff matters. Everything that I have is of no consequence as long as that guy exists. So you can see this this seething hatred that he has for Mordecai. And again, he mentions Mordecai, that Jewish man. So we're able to see from the outside that the hatred is may very well be because of Mordecai just as a, as a typical human. It is that additional part of it, that hatred towards him as the Jewish man. And it's, again, you can just see it throughout history. If you're careful with, with um, not only world history, but biblical history as well, that's part of world history, this this inordinate hatred that there is towards a very small group of people considering the, the population in the world. Why is it that there's such a focus of, of just seething hatred and loathing of people? And, uh, of course, I'd look at it as a Christian and say, well, it's because there's a spiritual aspect to it. These are, the, these are God's people. These are the ones that God chose among the nations to make himself known. Book of Deuteronomy, you get that in chapter 6 and 7. So when you start to look at that and you just go, there's, there are the promises of a forever kingdom and a Messiah and all that comes down through the line of Abraham, they have been singled out for hatred that has no good explanation aside from the unseen hand in spiritual ways and the devil always wanting to eradicate them. By this point in history, as we all know, 2,000 years after Jesus, the devil knows that there's no more, no more cards, if you will, to play. Messiah has come. He has done what he has done. He has lived and died and resurrected and, and conquered sin and death in the process. And we just see humanity and the, and the history of humanity kind of playing out until he returns. The devil knows for sure he can't win this. The only thing that he can do and the only thing that would hurt the heart of God is to destroy more people on the soulish level and, and have them turn from, a, from their loving God. Uh, to a life of separation from him. That's the devil's end game as it is right now. How many people can I take with me as I go into an eternity of, of torment? I want to take people with me. That's the devil's whole reason for existence currently. But here back at this time, if we believe that he really could have been that delusional to think, well, I can thwart this by destroying the line that would bring Messiah somehow, some way, as though God can't see in advance, here's a great indication how... God would know whatever is being put in place to try to do something. And not only is God going to intervene, but he's going to do so in such an obvious and extravagant, grand way. It'll be obvious to anybody who's looking that God has really had his hand in this whole thing. And that's where we are in the text. So he says, again, verse 13, in all, yet all of this, everything that I have, and let's look at the things he says again. Um, starting at verse 11, riches, the multitude of children, everything that, the, that he has been promoted by the king into, and that he's advanced him. He's the head of all of those guys, kind of prime minister to the king, if you will. Moreover, he said, besides, I've been invited by the queen herself with no one else except for the king. Look at all that I have that makes me unique, and there's no one like me. And yet that guy exists. And as long as he exists, none of this matters. Just this bizarre, incredible, filled with pride. And now he's going to go ahead and this is a, a personal gripe that he's got. Now he's going to make everybody else aware of it. Well, here's what he gets as far as his, his counselors from his wife to his friends. So then his wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends said to him, so there was agreement on this. Well, here's what you do. You've got that place of prominence. You've got the king's ear. You already know that you've got a day that you can go ahead and do whatever you're going to do to the Jews. Here's what you can do to make an example of him, and this will make you feel better. Now imagine this. How wicked and sickening and how disgusting must you be to think this is a good course of action. Here's what you can do to make yourself feel better. So, Haman, I know you're really bothered. I know that you're depressed and you're really saddened by the way that things are. So here's how you can cheer yourself up. I mean, how, how sick and disgusting is this? So... His, uh, his wife, Zeresh, and all of his friends said to him, do this. 
let gallows be made 50 cubits high. So probably somewhere in the, in the, in the area of about 100 feet tall. So that, the only reason you build something that big is for the most obvious reasons. You can get a huge, massive crowd around you. And if it's that high up, everybody's going to be able to see it. But again, it's the idea of making it extravagant. Why go, why go small when you can go big? We know that the guy is ridiculously wealthy, and we know that he has a place of incredible prominence. Now imagine if, at this point, Mordecai is known to the people as the one guy who is defiant against, against Haman. So Haman said, I've got the resources. His people tell him, you have the resources. You have the ability. That guy is openly defiant towards you. How much more will you solidify your position if you, in the most public of possible ways, before the edict is happening to the rest of the Jews, make an example of that guy? Make an example. And so that's, <clears throat> behind the scenes, he has no clue that what he's about to do of making an impression and, you know, making a statement is going to be made against him. But this sounds like the perfect remedy. Build a huge gallows, 100 feet tall, depending on the cubit and the measurement of it, but just round figures, about a, about, about 100 feet tall. And make a statement. Nobody will forget. The guy that defied you is the guy that you hung on the biggest gallows anybody's ever seen. And it was built by you, Haman, to put down your enemy. And this will be the way that you can do it. So make it 50 cubits high in the morning. Suggest to the king that, um, that Mordecai be hanged on it. And then go merrily with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and so he had the gallows made. Imagine how quickly that would happen. You've got less than 24 hours. You've got the rest of whatever's in the day. But by the morning, when you go to see the king, let him know what's going on and go hang Mordecai. And then you can have it completely off of your mind, off of your plate, and go in and do what makes you happy. You know, you'll get rid of that one thing, that the one thing around your neck that you just can't get past. You'll take care of a couple of things. You'll never have to see him again. You'll get rid of that, and you'll make a name for yourself even greater than it already is. Everybody will remember the name. Well, <laughs> here's what's funny. His name, his name is remembered to this day. And if you remember, as we looked last week, the casting of the lots, the poor, uh, would be to determine the day or the, the date and the month when all of this would happen. And so to this day, even now, Jews celebrate Purim, and Purim is the, the remembering of the casting of the lots, it should have meant their demise, but it was actually what led to the demise of Haman and the enemies that wanted to eradicate the Jews. And so it is a time when otherwise, when you, whenever you read his name, um, if you weren't, uh, didn't get a chance to listen to last week's study on this, to this day, they will read on Purim the entire book of Esther. And every time that Mordecai's name should be being read, they read it, but you can't hear it among the people because the noisemakers and everything is very festive. They drown out his name, that the name Morde or that the name Haman is not heard in the reading of the book. So I find that to be what you find in the in the um, uh, the celebration of of uh, of Purim is a very great way of just saying this is how thoroughly God removed everything that was concocted. Every every weapon fashioned against them did not prosper, as the Scripture says. So I think it's just a wonderful way of them remembering this man who had just such evil intent towards the Jews. His name is blotted out from sound uh, by other or by, by being heard by the the noisemakers that they have in their midst as they read this. It's it's poetic and it's just really really cool. So again, read verse fourteen. So they said all these things. Friends said to him, "Gallows be made fifty cubits high." Suggested the king. Uh, that Mordecai be hanged on it, and then you can go merrily. Just get it out of the way, go on to the feast, and you'll you know you'll have everything that you ever wanted, including getting rid of the one thorn in your side. Sounds like a great idea. And then it says, so he had the gallows made. So what we're going to find, we don't have time to do it today. When we get to chapter six next week, you're going to notice that also this respite and what happens in the intervening time. Had Esther done everything right up at the front, then there wouldn't be what happens. The events of chapter 6 would not have taken place where the king remembers something that has already taken place. And it's going to have a significant 
effect even further on what we've just read here. Had, had Esther said everything right up at the front end, Haman wants me and all of my people dead, and that's what he got you to agree to, king, and if that had been the end of it. The king wouldn't have been doing the things that you're seeing in chapter 6. What would not have been taking place is what we see at the end of chapter 5, the building of the gallows, that Haman sees Mordecai and he's angry. Some people might say, because of Esther's procrastination, that it opened the door for all of these other things. I'm sorry, but I see three days worth of fasting and seeking God in this. And the guy would say, what I want you to do is to go in there and start the whole festivities. Because I'm going to be doing some things in the interval of time. Go in and suggest that there is a day two. Because there's a day two, Haman sees Mordecai, goes and talks to his wife and his counselors, and they come up with the idea of hanging Mordecai in the morning. That night... Artic, or that night Xerxes is going to see something that he's going to uh, see a record of something because he can't sleep. Well, why can't he sleep? Well, we know why he can't sleep, because God's going to alert him to something that's going to change again in very significant ways the things going forward. So again, because God sees these things, I believe that he's orchestrating all of it. He's not just using clumsy people doing clumsy things. They are the ones who said, let us fast, and that means that we're going to seek him to whatever extent they did, to as much as they knew about him, we don't have the details on that. But his actions clearly show God is fully engaged in this. And he would be either way. He's going to preserve his people. But I believe that there's more going on with the hearts and the minds of these people, Mordecai and Esther and those who are, are ministering with them and, and ministering to them and praying with them than meets the eye. And if that's the case, then it explains why we have the enormous detail that we have in this and how... Uh, amazing the the God coming to the aid of his people is. It's pretty significant. So we'll pick up a chapter six next week. If you have any questions about anything that we've covered here, uh, I'd love to hear from you. And I, I really do genuinely love the feedback from the people here. We have a newsletter um, about to put it out. There's been so much news that I want to cover in the newsletter, significant things that are happening around the world. I just want to make sure that it's put together well. So uh, with that being said, uh, if you want to contact us to get added to that email list, you can do that. Um, it's kind of a newsletter type of a list. Um, or any other questions that you might have about this or any of our studies, then please contact us. You can do so through the ministry's website, and that is oldpaththeology.net. And you'll find there a contact us part of that page. You click on the contact us, it drops down a little email menu, and that comes directly to me. So we'll pick up a chapter 6 next week for what is incredibly intriguing, chapter 6 and 7. It's what we know about the book of Esther, but again, when you can slow down and look at some of the nuanced little pieces of it, I think we did some of that today, you might see things that you're not used to seeing unless you've studied the, the book before in depth with someone or even by yourself. But the idea that you can take what is a known story, most everybody knows the story of Esther. She was raised up to be a queen when she, that was not really what she had expected. It really led to the place where God used her to deliver her people. That's the big picture stuff. But to see God's hand in it, it's really pretty intriguing when you look at it, and it's so specific and it's so direct. So, um, again, I hope you're enjoying the study through this. I certainly am, and uh, look forward to picking up with chapter uh, 6 and 7 next week.